I started out talking and I said, I have a special place in my heart for college campuses because while I grew up in church all my life and cannot remember a day in which the Lord had not found me because my earliest memory of life is three years old telling my grandfather that I was saved but my parents didn't believe me. I can't remember anything before that. It's the first memory I have in my entire life was saying that I believed in Jesus. And my grandfather speaking over my life and saying, you're marked for the nations. And that's my only memory of his voice because he died when I was three. So the only memory I have is that you're called to ministry. So my earliest memory in life was that I'm saved. My only memory of my grandfather is that you're called to ministry. So I don't remember a time before not knowing the Lord. But even though I grew up with that heritage, it was not until college that I had an encounter with the Lord that changed my life forever. And this is not like a story where I ran from God, I hadn't run from Him. I was in love with Him and I thought I knew Him. But he wanted to reveal himself in a way like I've never known. And so I'm at college and I had heard all my life since I had grown, grown up in church, I had never experienced what I thought was fun. And so I kept hearing about these college parties. And so I'm a freshman and my parents dropped me off. So I hear they had this party and I'm torn because I'm like, well, I shouldn't go. And then I'm like, well, but I'm 18 and I should go. And I'm going back and forth, I shouldn't go. I, and I'm like a nerd, so it's not like I had really cool people to hang out with or even cool clothes, I still don't. I'm just, I'm just I don't, I'm not trendy. Daniel is, but I'm not. <laughs> I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, so I go. I decide after warring for a while, I'm gonna go. And so I'm standing outside this building where this party is supposed to be. And uh, I'm standing in line and this person who I've never met before, and no one knows who I am because I didn't go to a college with a bunch of my friends. So nobody knows who I am and I don't know anybody. So I'm standing in line by myself and this person comes up to me and says, what are you doing here? I say, I'm going to the party. He said, a person like you shouldn't be going to things like this. And so I'm like, leave me alone. I'm going to go. I mean, maybe he thinks I'm a nerd or something. I don't know. I'm not cool enough to get in. And there's a line to get in because the place is full. And, uh, but they wouldn't leave me alone. I kept saying, what is someone like you doing at a place like this? And I'm like, please leave me alone. You don't know me. They said, I'm telling you, you need to go home. That's what they kept saying. You need to go home. Go home. And I had made a determination that I wasn't going to be a nerd that day. I was going to stay. I normally would go home, but I'm going to stay in this line. And are like, okay, man, I'm telling you, go home. I'm like, nah, man, I'm not going home. I'm going to see what it's about. If I don't like it, I'll go home. You should go home. They kept pestering me. Finally, I get up to the door and the fire marshal comes and shuts it down. It says, everybody go home. And I went back to my room. Oh, I turned around to the person that had been pestering me for 30 minutes and it disappeared. Never saw him again. And I said, God, Apparently, my life doesn't belong to me. And the secret of salvation is you did not find him. He found you. And when you gave your life to his lordship, the things that you want don't matter as much as what he wants. 
And so some of us can find ourselves in a place of constant tension and frustration trying to go against the will of God and you cannot. You can run as fast as you want, but all you're going to do is run into him. You can't run from him. You must run to him. So I'm in my room and I'm like, my dorm room, which is small. And God really, really intended on me praying because I had two roommates in that dorm room. One of them was a local drug dealer and the other was into Wicca. And his girlfriend was studying to become a witch. And they used to have seances and tarot card readings and things from the room whenever I wasn't there. So I decided one day I'm going to take this oil. I'm going to put it on their bed. I'm going to put it on our door. I'm going to put it all around. And I prayed. And they tried to come into the room. And they kept saying there's a spiritual power in here that we cannot get rid of. And I learned through trial and tribulation having a roommate who was studying to be a Satanist and a wife or a girlfriend at the time who was studying to be a witch that their power was not more powerful than the power of our God. So because I prayed so much in the room, they asked to move because they couldn't be there. And the Lord marked my life. Not only did they get a chance to move, but the president of the university somehow heard about me and invited me to his house. And he asked me, show me some worship songs on the piano. So I, I didn't know why I was there. He said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you your own room. So he gave me my own room, my own dorm room. And I spent time with the Lord in that dorm room. And the Lord came to my room and visited me for three days. And I didn't go to class because I didn't want to leave and come back and he not be there. And I didn't eat either. And I didn't go anywhere and I didn't talk to anybody because I wanted to host his presence. And I didn't want him to leave. So he gave me an encounter and marked my life forever. Now, I was in the gospel choir at the university. I was telling Jessica, I love this. And we had a, a really good professor that was over it, but then he transitioned to another university and they were gonna cancel it because they didn't have anyone to take it over. And so I went to the dean and I said, well, man, I can run it until you find somebody. And so they, they said, well, we'll watch you do a rehearsal and if we find it satisfactory, we'll let you do it and let it be student run. And so I came, they came and watched the rehearsal and so they decided to let it be student run. And now, as an 18 year old freshman, our choir was over 100 people and as an 18 year old freshman, I'm leading this group, but I'm not leading them into songs. We're leading them into encounters because the Lord had marked my life. And during one semester, we saw a revolution happen on our campus because of a choir. There was a girl, we were ministering and I'm leading a time of worship and she screams and she grabs her head and she starts crying. And so we start praying. And she goes out and she's gone for a few days. She comes back and she says, I, and we're asking if anyone has a praise report or testimony. And she says, well, I do. So what is it? She says, well, when we were in the rehearsal, what I never told y'all is that I had a brain tumor. And while we were worshiping, I felt something happen in my head. And I went to the doctor and they can't find it anymore. Yeah. 
Then we had a drummer. I'm, I'm saying this for the whole room, but I'm saying this for you right now. I'm just not looking at y'all. We had a drummer who was the charismatic heart of our group because he was just the guy that was always smiling all the time. One time he, he comes in on crutches. I'm like, man, what happened to you? He's like, man, I was playing basketball and broke my ankle. I said, well, why don't you have a cast on it? Well, they're going to set it and then we're going to go tomorrow. I said, well, can we pray for you? He said, well, sure. I mean, if you want. It's broken. I said, I got it. God can heal it. I had faith because I had an encounter with God. And so I read in the scripture in Jesus he said, this man's daughter has died. He said, she's not dead, she's just asleep. But when he got there, they had professional mourners, so he put them all out. And he said, daughter, wake up, and she woke up. Then Peter, who was with them later on when Dorcas' daughter died, he found the same thing going on where he found a whole bunch of doubt and unbelief and people crying, and so he puts them out. And he prays and he raises Dorcas' daughter from the dead. And so I had the kind of faith that said, I believe God can heal a broken bone. And so I said, as an 18-year-old freshman leading this student-led group for one semester, um, if you don't believe that God can do this, leave. And if you do, stay. And so some people did leave and that's okay. And we laid hands on this brother's ankle and we prayed for him. And then the Lord said, I've done it. So I told him, I said, hey man, your, your ankle's healed. He's looking at me like, you think so? I said, yeah man, try it out. So he says, I guess I'm, it's a crutch. And he puts a little weight on it. He's like, hmm. Puts a little bit more weight on it, a little bit more weight on it. Then he goes, stands on one leg, takes his air cast off, throws his crutches away, and walks home. The following rehearsal, the following rehearsal, he brings two x rays one of a broken bone and the same one of a mended bone. The doctor said only God could do that. Let me fast forward. We, because I'm seeing miracle signs and wonders. I will see miracle signs and wonders. Because I'm not satisfied. And so uh, the Lord began to do things like that in our ministry but the thing was um, I don't go around saying like oh I have a healing ministry because it's for his glory not mine and I don't know what he's going to do when he's going to do it I just am obedient to him so but the Lord began to say you're going to see things that your eyes never thought you'd see so I've seen cancer healed with my eyes I've seen broken bones healed with my eyes and all sorts of other things. But the Lord said, you're going to begin to see things that you've ne never thought you'd see. And I didn't exactly know what that meant. And then last year, we're in Guyana. And we're invited to minister by the government. And the, the president of Guyana is not saved. But they said, we want to have you meet him. And so they brought me to the White House there. And they said, well, you know, we want you to meet him. And so, you know, we're, we meet with the president. And the expectation was that we'd give him some sort of word from the Lord, but I didn't have one. So I'm like, well, I'm not going to make anything up. And I'm not going to try to conjure something up. And so... He said, well, now that you're here at the White House, you can ask whatever you want. 
so I had one opportunity to ask him one thing and I said would you come tonight to our time of worship because I know that more can happen in the presence of God in a moment than what could happen in a thousand lifetimes of trying to convince somebody of anything. So he comes. Now, this scene is crazy because we're in an outdoor park and thousands of people are out there and then the presidential motorcade pulls up. Now, every believer in this nation knows that the president's not saved, but every believer in the nation also knows that it's a presidential motorcade, so people are going crazy when this man pulls up. And so he sits down, and we begin to minister. And he stands up politely, uh, and then they send word that he wants to say something. Well, how many of you know that no matter who you are, when the president says, I want to say something, the concert stops for a second. So this man gets up and he offers the nation back to God. Now, the significance of this is the previous president for 16 years had banned God from the nation and said that God was not allowed in their country. So now we can make decrees uh, from our platform and things can happen in the spirit. But how many of you know that when the sovereign elected official of a land makes a decree, it, that's a decree. It, it stands. And so with our very eyes, one of the greatest miracles that I ever saw was not just a tumor being healed and not just a broken bone being healed, but we literally saw an entire nation given back to God. But you know what? I'm still not satisfied. And so I'm at home, and a friend of mine who's a missionary in China sends me a, a Facebook message in the private message section, and they say, um, the Lord's been giving me dreams about you. And, and I, this is what I see, and this is a very strong, trusted, prophetic voice. I understood it wasn't dead. Everyone just making it up. And they're like, um, in the course of your ministry, you're going to see dead people be raised. And gave me the exact number of how many that we'd see in our ministry raised from the dead. Now, <laughs> I could do that whole spiritual, physical, figurative thing, but that's not what the Lord was saying. And I'm extending and stretching my faith in this moment to tell you this and I, I say this publicly because it's not about me or on me or my responsibility to do anything but release my faith. The reason why we stop singing for just a moment to share these things with you is because I don't want you to become comfortable with the way things are. The church is the most powerful entity in the entire universe because it is the vehicle by which Jesus speaks, acts, and moves. Nothing is more powerful than his church. And the world cannot change for the better without the church. <laughs> I, I could stay there for a while, but I won't. This is, this is what I want to say to you. I would prefer that you go back to your apartment, your house, your dorm, and say, God, give me an encounter, the kind that will change me and everyone around me forever. The encounter that I had when I was 18 years old is the catalyst for me standing in front of you now. I didn't do anything to be here. I want you to hear me. I'm not the greatest singer, I'm not the greatest songwriter, I'm not the greatest anything. Because power in the kingdom is not based on ability, but availability. I never said, I never said, I'm gonna write songs and we're gonna do something big. I never said that. As a matter of fact, I said the opposite. Because I had the privilege of of being a worship pastor at a church with some great people. Jessica Rivera was one of them. And I see so much in her that I said, 
God, I will invest my life into raising up people like that and seeing them released. I don't have to be the one. True story. I said, God, I'm really okay with being here at this place and seeing other people go. Because I felt like there's, what good is it for you to go and do anything if the people that God has called you to serve aren't growing? What do I have to say to anyone in the nations of the earth if the people that God has given me themselves aren't growing? That means I'm failing. So I was really okay with making sure that these people were discipled enough to have a relationship with God and go and change the world. And I was really okay with that until the Lord said, I want you to take up the pen as a writer because I have something I want you to say. And then he went on to say, when you speak what I'm speaking, I'll make a way for my message. He never told me that I'll make a way for you. He said, I'll make a way for my message, which means that my responsibility is as a messenger. And the moment that I'm not doing that anymore, he has the right to find someone else who will. All I want to be is a messenger for him. I really don't care about the chart positions. It's been cool, but that's not what I was after. People ask me, you know, when you wrote this song, did you think it was going to do this? And I'm like, I had no idea. I had, I literally had no idea. When, and then when I say I had no idea, I mean like, I really, like the song that most people, you name this night after, um, well, I wasn't even going to record it. And the only reason why we recorded it was not because it was on our song list. It was because I wanted to honor what God was doing in a moment and we were making a declaration about how God has caused us, called us to change the world and there was only one reasonable response to that. And so in a spontaneous moment, an unplanned, unrehearsed moment, we just said, I give myself away so you can use me. And everyone was like, well, wow. And I'm like, I didn't know. But God wants to do so much more greater. Because I'm not peaking. And what I mean by that is, there's nowhere else to go in the industry for me. What I mean by that is, we released the last CD and it was number one. That's not what I, 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 the point is, there's no number higher than one. So what, what else am I supposed to do? Run after idolized trophies called Grammys so I feel better? So I said, look what I've accomplished. Who cares? If it happens, praise God, not me. But I'm not satisfied with hearing about miracles, signs and wonders happening around the world and we're seeing them with our own eyes but not seeing them in the land that I live in. God has a heart for America. <laughs> Just like he does the rest of the world. He has a heart for America. He has a heart for Knoxville. He has a heart for UT. And he wants to use us to change the world. And I'm not satisfied with reading about stuff that I know is available, but we're not experiencing. I'm not satisfied hearing about stuff that I know is available, but we're not experiencing. I'm not satisfied with that. And so just like I had an encounter when I was 18 years old, I'm still saying I'm not satisfied. I'm not satisfied. I know there's more. 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 And I'm not going to stop until I see more. Until I see more. Until I see more. Until I see you do more through me. I'm not satisfied where I've been. Though I've cried out. Still I want more I want to go deeper I want to go further I want to go high 
than I've ever been. Be flat for me, please. Does anybody feel like I feel tonight? Um, I'm going to ask you to lead something. I'm going to ask you to lead something. And we're going to sing a song of surrender. And I want you to come down here and lead what surrender looks like. Would you do that? Could you come? All of you. One more thing that marked me and Daniel, my brother, yesterday in Montgomery, Alabama, we went to the church where Martin Luther King was pastor. And we stood behind the pulpit where he preached. And we read about this stuff. And I was so blown away by the fact that this man was 24 years old when he started pastoring that church. 25 years old when he helped lead the bus boycott. 26 when they bombed his house. A world changer. I believe God wants to do something with the generation that surrenders to him. God's not through with our nation, but it has nothing to do with politicians. They're going to mess it up. This is a strategic opportunity for the church. The reason why, I'm not going to get political on you, but the reason why we have a no choice election is because there's an opportunity for the church. The world can't change without the church. This city can't change without you. This university cannot change without you. This is written on my heart. I surrender all to you. Everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Lord, I surrender all to you. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Would you sing it with me? I surrender. I surrender to you. Everything I give to you. You guys sing that with us. I surrender. I surrender all to you. Everything I give. Everything I give to you. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding nothing. Withholding Come on, if you mean that in this room, would you sing it? I surrender. Come on, would you lift your hands? Let's demonstrate surrender. Let's demonstrate surrender. Everything I give, oh God, it all belongs to you. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing. The generation that means this will change the world. I surrender. I surrender all.
want that kind of encounter, just tell him as you worship, say, I give God wants to give it to you God wants to give it to you, an encounter like you've never known I give myself away so you you can use me oh God I give myself away here I am Lord here I am Lord I give that in this room everything I give
withholding nothing. Lord, I surrender, I surrender everything I give. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing, holding nothing, holding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. Can we lift up our hands? Can we lift up our hands? Just say this one more time. Say hi. Everything. Come on, let him know. Withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing, withholding nothing. And I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No time. This is an important statement here. Though none go in, still I will fall. Though mm -hmm. no, none go, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. I can't. I've been changed I've been healed I've been free Delivered And I found joy I found peace Thank God for grace Anybody have that testimony? Heal. I've been free. I've been delivered. And in the presence of God, I found joy. I found peace. And once again, so thankful for grace.
you sound like you mean it. Just one more time, say. reasons I was telling y'all this story about my encounter with God. It's not my only encounter. It just so happened to be a significant one. Is that no one can ask for the encounter better than you. And what I'm saying is that a lot of times we come down here and people pray for us and we nod our head in agreement but we ourselves are not asking and I don't want you to go back to wherever you came from and you yourself not ask because he hears you because there's something that you can ask in a way that you can ask it in your own words from your own heart that no one else can articulate for you like you and I just believe that you're here because you want more. So I'm going to ask you, you don't have to look at me now. I want you to close your eyes for just a moment. And the reason I'm having you close your eyes is because I want you to become aware of the nearness of God in this moment. Because he's here. And I want you to respond to that awareness. He is Emmanuel, God with us. He's not apart from you right now. He's not standing off in the distance. He's right here. There's nothing you could have done to disqualify you from being in this moment. Even if you feel guilty for the way you've been living, the fact that you feel guilty at all is an indication that he's near you. Because he's holy, if you fall, you're going to feel that because you're still in his presence. You should be more afraid when you fall and you can't sense his presence. That means you're far, but when you fall, and you can still sense his presence, that means he's near you. So there's nothing in this moment that you could have ever done to disqualify you from being in this moment right here, right now. Now that you are aware, now that you are aware, I want you, I want you to ask him for an encounter in your own words. Some of you might lift your hands. Some of you might bow. But I want you to ask the Lord to invade your space. Invade your life. Mark your life forever. Let this be the moment. Let this be the moment that you knew you were changed. Let this be the moment that you knew. Ask him. Ask him, he's right here. Invade, invade our lives. 
some of you will begin to sense him like you never had before because he wants to give you an encounter. Father, by your Holy Spirit, would you move? Would you move among your people? Let there be a wave of your presence that invades these people. Let there be a wave. Touch, Lord Jesus. Holy Spirit. Holy Spirit. Touch your people. 